So thank you very much everyone for coming out. Really, really appreciate it. We haven't done a physical event in a while. So it's nice to actually see everyone here. I think everyone over here is involved in the NFT space or looking to do something. I'm not even going to try and introduce everyone because they've all got very interesting things that they're doing. So I think, Andrea, I don't know if we can start with you. Uh, if you can maybe just introduce yourself, how you got into the NFT space and what you're doing in it. Thank you so much for having me. And um, um, my name is Adriana. I'm a fashion artist with a decade of experience in the fashion industry and luxury. I'm based in London and I've worked with uh, very different fashion brands over the years, and I graduated from London College of Fashion. What brought me to the NFTs was the nature of my work, is that I'm a multimedia artist, also a musician, and I've always struggled with um, combining my art as a physical piece, because mainly I was commissioned or created digital fashion illustrations, um, but really NFTs enabled me to showcase my potential in a full space and also for collectors. I discovered it um, last March, Randomly on Clubhouse is one of the applications where you can connect with lots of people and I just got fascinated and hooked by this immediately because I knew that was going to be like a big game changer due to the nature of my work and I've been involved in this space for a while um, and releasing my NFTs based on my fashion illustrations and also have other bigger projects in mind uh, but yeah that's the intro so far. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Mateo? Hello, my name is Badir Awi. My company here in Cayman is Awesome Productions. We do video production services. Our clients are mostly video productions that come to Cayman to film here. So they come from abroad. I'm a filmmaker, that's why I got into production. I love the medium of film. And I first heard about NFTs, I guess. Well, I could, we could go back to when I first started hearing about Bitcoin, I remember you know, 10 years ago, I had a friend of mine talking about Bitcoin. Bitcoin didn't really know what it was. And I think in 2018, uh, I, was, I worked on a doc, a documentary on Bitcoin. And that's when I became a lot more interested in it. And fell in love with the blockchain technology, as we all have. For me, that's the real substance behind everything. NFTs, Bitcoins, whatever it is in the crypto space. And it kind of... the blockchain technology really aligned a lot with my sort of philosophy and understanding of the universe. So I was just very interested in that. I don't have any NFTs. I am working on a film this year and the organizer, Mark, who's standing up over there, is trying to get me to release the film as an NFT. And um, we just kind of sparred back and forth and whether I should do that or not. And um, over a cup of coffees and meeting a couple of times, he's like, you know what, come to this event discuss you know your feelings about nfts and i was like all right sure so uh that's why i'm here my name is mark lawrenson um i'm a local pop art artist my known work is through stoked and uh, dos tortugas is uh, a brand new company that i started up with my business partner ansel which is up in the crowd um I didn't know anything about NFTs. I didn't really follow anything to do with cryptocurrencies. It was an event in November at uh, the Bird here in the Cayman Islands that um, it all kind of happened. Uh, I was commissioned to do a painting and uh, it, was, it was a walrus. So I actually thought it was like a kid's party and I didn't know that it was a it was an actual thing. And um, it wasn't until a lot of young people were actually coming through the doors and telling me a little bit of their story about what it was. And I realized, oh, wow, this is actually something totally different. And um, like I said, that the same night I met my business partner where he um, kind of gave me the lowdown. Uh, he's in Dos Tortugas. He's the, the crypto guy. I'm more of the, the art um, creator. But um, I've had to cram in a lot since November. Um, but the best part about uh, about doing it is, is obviously you have to learn very fast to be able to move forward in all the different stages. So um, yeah, we've we've now created our collection and we're really excited for this year to uh, to launch it here in the Cayman Islands. In case any of you don't know me already, uh, people call me Dreddy. I don't think I have anything to add to what uh, these guys have all said. Um, we're all sort of learning about uh, the whole NFT space and um, trying to find a little uh, spot of our own in it. 
Awesome. And I think the one thing Shane didn't mention is he actually did one of our first NFTs in Cayman. And we did the auction last year. Um, so he is actually an NFT artist that we have already done. I know when we were discussing this, we were sort of debating on what the general knowledge of the audience would be in terms of an NFT space. So um, we sort of said, we'll do a quick, um, just a brief, what is an NFT? For me, the way I usually think about NFT is thinking about the Mona Lisa. So if you think about the Mona Lisa, it's up in the Louvre. Anyone can go there. They can take a picture of the Mona Lisa. They can see it. But the Louvre is the only entity that actually owns that, and they've got the rights to that. If you're thinking about digital art, about digital pieces that have been created, I mean, we all know a JPEG, and you can copy and paste it. And there's a lot of people talking about that side. You know, I've screenshotted your NFT. Um, there's no value behind this. But as Badira said, I think the blockchain aspect and where the blockchain is actually, you can verify it, you can prove ownership, you can transfer ownership. Um, that's where there's real value in this. And you have an NFT, which is a unique item. Um, so NFT, non-fungible token. And non-fungible meaning that you cannot make a copy of it. It is a unique item. Um, so I think that's where it's really, really valuable. On that side, I mean, um, Shane, um, I wanted to actually find out, I mean, you exclusively work um, with digital. I mean, you create everything digitally, all of your art. You've been working in this, you know, in that space for ages. What do you think about that idea of ownership being becoming more digital? Um, yeah, I think it's a I think it's a good idea. I, I look at it. Um, I was just thinking about that today, uh, Petri. I, I I'm looking at it as just another aspect of 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 selling something. It becomes easy for me because all the art is already digital, as you said, um, and so if I offer that art in the same way that I offer to, to send the printer uh, a print that he will print and ship to you. If I offer you any of that art as an NFT uh, and you can request it that way and I can send it, um, it can be uh, given, given an NFT address, a blockchain um, address, and it becomes yours that way, uh, you can post it on your digital screen at home, um, you can stick it in your... Uh, Jeez, I want to swear here, but I'm not going to. You can stick it in your metaverse, you, you, you know. Um, you can you can do whatever you want with it in a digital sense, in the same way that I can ship a um, a print to to London and somebody can hang it on their wall. And Andreana, I mean, you're focusing um, on the on sort of the design side, um, but also on the um, fashion side of it. Um, I mean, you've done quite a few works. You've already sold some of your NFTs. What's your experience been sort of with that process of selling NFTs um, and going on the design side of things? Yeah, so um, there's often like a misconception of me as a fashion artist. So I'm not a fashion designer. I'm an art director and fashion illustrator. Um, and I think you could have seen one of my pieces over there. So it's literally art inspired by fashion. And uh, it's really interesting um, because actually it's a very old genre of art. and. Um, I wanted to give it like a fresh perspective, a new life. So when I joined the space, it was really interesting because I, well, not only was like literally one person who was involved in fashion, but also like very, very few women. So, but it still didn't stop me. It was just like the process of like onboarding more women. And it's also been interesting because it's actually been uh, said that there's only 5% of female artists in the NFT space that are making sales. That was the um, based on the um, equation from like December last year, which is really kind of disheartening. But I, I see it shifting and I, again, actually want to get to the subject. It's really been beneficial for me to release my collection. Um, I waited some time, I waited for the right moment because I felt like I was competing with Bored Apes, which is completely different from my style. And then the, the sudden movement of women joining this space, obviously it's very, very small compared to men, still dominated by men, really helped me to get some confidence and say, hey, you know, maybe there's gonna be someone interested in fashion art and fashion illustration. So I built a lot of community on Twitter and this is a huge game changer, like for anyone who wants to go into the NFT space, it's like, you have to be really active on Twitter, um, Clubhouse as well, but I've not less as much as last year. And yeah, it was like, uh, it's a process and I'm still obviously enjoying it so much because it's like, 
I really connect on a deep level with people who like my work and it's like building personal relationships all over the world. And um, yeah, and because of that movement of women NFTs and there's been like some big uh, women led projects that have been very successful recently, it gave a spotlight to me as well. So it's like we build each other and give highlight to each other. The women community is very supportive as well, but there's also obviously very supportive men. So most of my collectors are actually men, which is really nice. <laughs> this is how it led me to sales. And I'm really happy because there's only one left in my collection right now. And I'm planning to release another bigger project next month. And um, it's worth mentioning as well, because I want to build like uh, the community, not only in the Twitter space. It's, that's why this event is fantastic because I think you know it's really important to connect with people in real life here and now as well. So that was the intention for me as well to have my solo exhibition that I'm working on right now and I'm gonna be the first NFT artist and also female artist um, in Warsaw in Poland to have my solo show on NFTs. Because in, to me, it, that, that's exactly the process I'm talking about the sales and bringing more people on board. The more people are aware of it, the more we bring more attention. And obviously there's more success for everyone from different point of views. Like it's not, doesn't have to be just us as artists thriving, but also collectors, because my intention is that if I'm, you know, becoming bigger in the space, then my collector can sell my work for a much bigger price. So I think it's just a beautiful community and I'm loving so far every aspect of it. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing to hear. And um, that community side of it is really interesting because I think for the artist, you're not selling just locally, just in your town or your city. I mean, you're really selling to the entire world. Mark, you've, you've got a project that you're planning at the moment. Um, Adriana touched on Twitter, the marketing aspect of it. I know you've given this quite a bit of thought with community and those kinds of things. I mean, how are you thinking about that and how important is that to the NFT industry? The the fun part about our collection is that we do want to really showcase K-Man's pop culture. We have uh, international looks, um, but the the collection it will be more dominant on the Cayman looks. Uh, a lot of people, uh, obviously, if they're not from here, they might not understand some of the looks. And that's by putting international looks in there, it kind of helps them um, want to be a part of it as well. But the idea for us is that we really want to put Cayman on the map. Um, we've seen a lot of stuff that's coming out of the States um, and um, a lot of different other projects. And the idea was that if, um, you know, internationally, if they're going to do, you know, such amazing jobs on, on, on their projects, we want to try and aim for the sky and do it here. One of the things that uh, Shane was saying about the advantages of the NFTs for, um, for here, is that you have a great chance of going international. Uh, a lot of the artists, um, you know, they, they'll build their art up inside the communities, and um, you know, the community we may know them as you know uh, for what they do and the art that they make. But then what happens is it's then trying to get it to go international, which is the hard part. So with these NFTs, the amazing part is that it's not just the Cayman Islands that it's going to be able to buy it there is an in international uh, market that people could then go on and, and purchase it. So then all of a sudden, you know, yes, it'll be, you know, pretty big in Cayman, but then, then again, you know, part of Australia, it might be really big there, it might be really big in Germany, we, I, I, I don't know. And that's the fun part, and that's the, the part that's, that's uh, really exciting for me on these NFTs, is that, you know, the, our community will obviously understand it a lot more but it's to then see what the international market then d does with it as well. Awesome. So, Badir, I know, I mean, there's a lot of hype around this as well. Um, a lot of people getting very excited. Um, what do you sort of think about long term um, in terms of the hype, in terms of will we see this lasting? Is it just a hype cycle that will die down over a period of time? Yeah, I think the most effective way to look at NFTs and crypto in general is long term. I'm very cautious of short term. It reminds me a lot of the internet when the internet was first starting. It's like a lot of the same buzz. And when the internet first started, there was a lot of startups. And I mean, we can't even remember half of the names of all those companies that, that were around when the internet started. And it's like, okay, it's been what? I don't know, 20 years since the internet? What have we, like, what were the changes that those long term? advantages that the internet brought rather than those short-term companies that were popping up left, right, and center. That's how I'm interested in blockchain in general and the NFT space. 
if there is an advantage, I think, at least for me personally, I'm not saying that you can't um, make something in the short term. Um, but, you know, for me personally, I find it more advantageous to look at it in the long term because it's the same thing with the internet. Like, when that, when that was happening, it was like, okay, I can upload my song to the internet and someone in China can buy it. So, you know, that promise was already there that we're sort of hearing now with the NFTs again. But it still didn't change the fact that, you know, no one in China downloaded the song, right? Because they didn't know. So uh, there's still that hurdle. So, you know, for artists, we, we tend to get very excited and we want to be, be known and we, we want to like, be seen and we want our work to be seen. So something like the internet, something like NFTs is obviously very exciting for us. I think it works very well with music more so than, than anything else. It's like almost like a natural fit. For music, I mean, is Spotify not going to switch over to a complete NFT blockchain system? They must, right? So, um, yeah, I think there is a little bit of hype, but that's exciting because you know something's happening and we can't really quite figure it out. You know, it's all in the air. We're all here. Like, I, I didn't even imagine this many people were going to come, but you know, it's it is exciting. And so, I don't want to discredit the hype. I think that's important. But me personally, I. I tend to want to examine it long term. If, you, if you're starting something now, what's your five year plan with that, at least, or 10 year plan? You know? Awesome. No, agreed 100%. I think the other thing you touched on Spotify and for the artists is where it's really interesting where an artist can potentially share in a percentage of fortune, future revenues, et cetera. So there's very nice potential revenue streams for artists as well. I wanted to, the next question is sort of an open question, so any of you guys can grab it. Um, Shane sort of alluded to the metaverse, people you know, putting up things um, in their houses in the metaverse. I think a lot of kids these days, they're very familiar with skins, you know, putting out new outfits, new haircuts. I was talking to um, actually a partner at a law firm and he was saying that his kid is always getting the bucks in the game. And he's like, well, what are you doing? She's like, well, look, Danny, I bought this new haircut. Don't you look and think it looks nice? What do you guys think, and anyone can grab this, about the metaverse and NFTs and the use of that um, in the metaverse? I, I like the microphone. Um, well, again, I, I think it goes right back to, to what I said earlier. It, it's, it's just another avenue, a, a place for you to put your, your art. Um, and if, uh, you know, if people are going to be building houses and outfitting them and buy, buying themselves clothes in the metaverse, there's no reason why they shouldn't um, just hang a piece of your art in there as, as well. My little girl is an absolute fanatic of Roblox. And um, she, I didn't know that, that it was a part of it where you had to then, it, I think it's Robux or something like that, like you were saying before. She's only six, and, uh, but she's, she's already well adapted. Uh, she could play the games before she could even read, which was the m most amazing part. And she knew exactly what to do. There's a, a fashion part of it where they would tell you, okay, you know, it's the best aquatic look. And she gets to run around and choose all the different p p uh, bits and pieces. And then it's, it's almost, which is crazy, but for, especially for a six-year-old, that's her type of entertainment. She's getting used to having it where, okay, I have uh, an image and it's almost like a, it's an avatar. So, you know, for this avatar now to look like me, I need to have long hair, you know, uh, pink dress, uh, fancy shoes, and you know the 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 normal parts that they do let you uh, use for your avatar to then be able to make it fancier and, and look better. Then you'd have to pay for it. So yeah, so sadly, it's uh, we have a, a point system with my little girl at the moment, and as long as she gets uh, good grades at school, the, the teacher calls it putting the pin up, and she has to have so many in a row, and then we uh, we buy a robot uh, robux. I think the cool thing about blockchain is it, it's, it's everywhere. It can be, it's in the universe, it's in the metaverse. It's almost sort of like that unifying principle. And I think like, we're all gonna have to go over the blockchain at some point. I think that's kind of what we feel. Like everything kind of has to get shifted over. So the fact that you can have an NFT in the metaverse makes perfect sense. Yeah, I think I'm gonna just add to my perspective from the fashion person involved in, like, in the industry. Um, there's also been a lot of movement in the fashion industry, the metaverse, and a lot of luxury brands have been like trying to catch up on the, you know, the trends and how they can adapt as well to this new world. And there have been like big fashion houses like um, Balenciaga and you know Dolce Gabbana, and it's very interesting. For example, that's the interesting point where Dolce Gabbana did uh, a while ago a collection that was based on their 
signature pieces from like 1950s and they just created like the digital version of them and they were sold for like a lot of money basically and um and i don't know like i still have a like um I don't know, mixed uh, experience with what I think about metaverse is definitely happening. It's definitely not gonna stop. Um, Decentraland, which is like this place where you can go and create your avatar and join different events uh, in this kind of like, you know, um, digital world, right? Where you can meet other people. It is interesting. I think it's a shift as well in the perception. Like you were talking about your daughter, um, you know, that's gonna be very, very natural for her because it's a different generation. And yes, obviously I did play games and I used to play Sims, you know, like, and I used to even buy skins, which is quite funny. So I have that experience, and but I have never been really involved in it that much. But I still try to understand the, you know, value of the dress in the metaverse. Funny enough, I'm actually going to Digital Fashion Week New York in like a week where I also have my uh, work exhibited as part of it, but I'm not, again, like my work is gonna be exhibited as a fashion illustration, but not as a digital fashion design, but part of the event is actually um, the fashion runway with digital fashion pieces, and they're incredible. Like from the you know creative point of view, there are absolutely stunning pieces, and what I think gives a perspective from the positive side of it is that obviously there's a totally different aspect of fashion design. You can create something totally abstract and you know, something that you can't do in a physical form. You know, like we're talking about, you know, I don't know, my friend has is, is a sunglasses designer. She wants to do like fishes swimming in her sunglasses, you know what I mean? So we're talking about very interesting part of the creativity. And I'm sure as Metaverse develops, we'll be able to utilize these objects more interesting way in actual avatars. Um, and the other thing that is interesting as well is the sustainability. Because um, I personally also had this kind of like a crisis with the fashion industry where I was tired of, you know, um, too many brands, fast fashion is a huge issue. We're polluting this planet too much with like unnecessary clothing. And maybe there is something about the metaverse and the fashion, you know, design that's digital because we're obviously, there's a, also a huge debate on like how NFTs and blockchain is affecting in a negative way, uh, the, um, you know, the, our ecosystem, but still I think digital is definitely less harmful than huge productions and warehouses um, all over the place. So I, I don't know, I mean, it, it's interesting definitely and I'm still exploring it and uh, that's my, you know, thought about it. Awesome. Uh, I think one of the really interesting things is the creativity side of it, where, I mean, there's really cool artworks that are moving and interacting and all kinds of things. I know there's an artist out there that they do AI generative art where you input certain parameters and the AI creates something for you, but they've created tokens where you can decide what the parameters are. So I decide what it is and I create something that's my parameters that were inputted. So there's really interesting new ways. I mean, I didn't think I was ever gonna own an art piece, but have a piece of some AI um, that can be very interesting. Um, on that, um, another thing that's really interesting is sort of the collections where you can collect, you can trade, you can do all those, those kinds of things. Mark, I know with your project that you're planning at the moment, you guys have sort of tradability and those kinds of things built in. Um, I don't know if you can tell us a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Obviously, we, we, we couldn't have got a bigger screen, um, but um, I think there's been some slides that's came up here. Um, we've tried to um, make, it's, it's very funny. I've had a lot of practice of trying to explain it to my mom and dad um, on how this works um, because you know they obviously want the best for me and they, they think I'm mad and trying to do digital designs. But some of the slides that pops up, uh, we will have uh, 50 full-faced images. And then from the 50 images, we will then split them into, uh, fractionalize them into four. And then what happens is we are now generating uh, 9,950 from the original 50 designs. Uh, so they're all somewhat unique. Uh, the fun part about that is, you know, you'll get a little bit of Michael Jackson in there. Uh, and the, you got Foots from the Brack. Um, I think there's a geisha girl and, and um, a, you know, a diver. Um, so. The fun part about it is that even with it being fractionalized, it actually does kind of have a really kind of fun look. Um, and you know, some people are into that one. Some people want to collect the full image. Um, the idea that we're going to be doing with it is uh, we have a second collection that's going to be coming right behind it called uh, the, the Tradables. And what happens is as long as you have the image that matches the, 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 the four different boxes to complete a full image, 
Uh, if you trade it back to us, then we will give you a full image on the, the second collection, which is the tradables. Now, the second collection won't be for sale. It will only be given through the tradable aspect. Um, and then, like I said, we will have um, a large number. We've actually had to work out how many trades we're able to do to make the, the second collection. Um, but I do have friends already that are interested in, 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 in purchasing the the, uh, the designs, but they don't want the the different the, the full image. They want to keep it as as a fragmented image, which is really fun. And then we've got some sponsors as well that's came on board, and um, a part of their sponsors is a, is a custom NFT. And uh, some of them have even said that they don't want it to be a full image, they would like it fractionalized, and that way they can kind of really have fun with, with what they want to do and, and how the design comes about. So, um, yeah, like I said, we're very interested in, and um, we understand that, you know, every, some people would like to just collect them to have them on their, uh, their as an asset in their wallet, or that uh, some people would actually want to be a part of a, playing a, some sort of a game to see how well that they can get through. And, and you know, if, if they're not lucky on the, the first, uh, um, buying that they would be able to trade their way into being able to get a really fun, cool Caymanian pop culture look. I think that it's it's a very interesting concept. Um, so well done for coming up with that, and it okay. it brings in a very interesting value aspect to it because if I've got three tiles and I want a full image, that one guy that has the tile in the top right corner becomes becomes very valuable to me all of a sudden. It it does. It, it actually helps people as well that that you know there's, there's going to be some that's going to want to buy ten. And there's some that's going to buy 20, but there's, it also gives the, the possibility for people that if they only want to buy one just to be a part of it, um, obviously the you know if the quicker they sell it, uh, just to make you know to kind of flip it, which is great. Um, but they can also hold on to it, and it all really depends on how desperate someone is, is to make a match. Uh, now some of the looks are very hard to make matches, and some of them are very very easy. Um, and then it all depends on the match that they do make on when they trade it back, uh, our, our matrix will, will um, then give out, you know, on the, some sort of the rarity scale. I've got a question for you. Yes. Um, uh, are the first sales, are they randomized? Um, how do you avoid somebody picking up four pieces in the beginning? So, so yeah, all of them. Um, and, and sorry, the background, in case anybody doesn't know, this is those, these are the, the uh, turtles. Sorry, yes, this is the, 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 the proud turtles. Yep, they're right there. Oh, yeah, so these are actually some of the fun looks that we... Yeah, it's great. So what happens is um, we did want to obviously make sure that we mixed in some Cayman to these international looks. Um, like I said, Cayman is the big part of what we want to do and, and, and promote. Um, we have a, 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 a great couple of uh, uh, three islands that we wanted to, to, to display. But yeah, no, like, just like you said, when we do uh, launch these, that they will be randomly generated. So what happens is that uh, everybody that would be in a whitelist uh, will have the possibility to buy before it goes live. Um, they would then basically, the link would come up, they would press buy. Um, they wouldn't get to see what the image is until they actually own the image. Um, and it's all, it's completely uh, random. The fun fact that I'd, I'd love to tell everybody is that my image that I've created of myself, uh, Mark Lawson from Stoked, is uh, also going to be in there. And the lottery is that uh, whoever does get that one, I am willing to buy it back for, for uh, say, 5,000, 10,000, whatever it is like that. See? Because that's, that's the one I want. That's, I, that's, that's, that's the image I have. I'm putting it into the generation. I will be playing this game just as much as everybody else. And, um, so it is going to be the, the, the fun part of that. Uh, it's not just myself, my business partner as well. His is in there. Uh, I have one of my, my wife, uh, Glam Pam, which is a great one. Um, so we, you know, they're, they're, we are putting in some, uh, some people uh, that are already invested into the company that, um, that once the, the full film, uh, image, uh, well, once we do go live and, the, and they all sell out, that. Uh, we will be hunting to try and find out who actually uh, got those images, and we will be uh, looking to to buy them back. I think Shane's got his eye on one. On he's going to try and buy yours. <laughs> 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 Good, <come back. laughs> 
<laughs> awesome. So um, I think the one other thing I definitely wanted to discuss, Badir, is um, around the film industry, because I think that's something that's very new. People are busy just exploring the options there. I mean, we're all very familiar with director's cuts and all those kinds of things, outtakes, whatever. I know there's some you know, producers and owners of movies where they've now specific cut scenes. You can buy the NFT and own that NFT of that scene. For you as a filmmaker, um, I mean, is that something that's really interesting to you with new revenue streams, new ways to give people a way to interact with your content and your films? Yeah, it's interesting theoretically. You know, I, I'm still not convinced to do my next film as an NFT because I don't quite see the advantage that I'll get from that. But th because I do believe blockchain is the future and that eventually everything will become NFT'd, that, you know, it is exciting. And I don't think the roles w in the industries will go away. I think you'll still have, you know, managers, you know, you'll have producers, you'll have distributors. I think we kind of feel the NFTs may give us the possibility of cutting out those middlemen. I'm not convinced the internet didn't do it. So I'm not really convinced that NFTs will either. So it's exciting, you know, I mean, I think, you know, when, when I'm thinking business opportunities, you're like, you know, I think along the lines of, you know, a distributor, setting up that distribution company that can distribute the films that are NFTs and track the residuals for the rest of time. You know, that's, that's kind of interesting. And um, me as an individual filmmaker, um, right here, right now, it's cool to talk about, um, I'm not really convinced to do my next film this year as an NFT, but definitely for the future, it's, it's the future. Oh, awesome. I think, yeah, there's a lot to explore. and I'm sure people are going to think of new and creative ways to use it that we haven't even considered. Um, I think we've got about 15 minutes left, so we'll turn it over to the audience to see if anyone has any questions, anything that they're wondering about. I'll come around with the mic, so if you can just put up your hand if anyone has any questions. Hi guys, my name is JR, working on my own little, uh, with my team, uh, uh, NFT project. You guys will hear about that soon, but one of the questions that I wanted to ask is how do you guys feel about um, the utility side of the projects you're working on and future projects in came in, in the sense, you mentioned earlier, Bored Ape. One of the things that's been driving the value of those NFTs are the uh, exclusive memberships that the owning an NFT offers. Do you guys think we can see something like that in Cayman? Maybe a collaboration of all NFT projects getting into special events and places, or your own NFT projects doing something like that? Do you guys see or have any, that kind of thing in the plans? Um, we are actually working on a utility package. The idea behind our uh, collection is that we would be releasing 10,000 um, and once obviously the, the trade the sets are made and that they're traded back We're actually going to be destroying the the items that are traded back to us once they do receive a, a new image um, The idea on that is that we want to take our 10,000 images and actually drive it down to about 3,000 and we want to create a very exclusive membership um, Like I said, it all depends on if people are actually wanting to keep their, their fragmented image or if they wanted to turn it into a full-faced image. Um, but something that we are, um, are working with right now is that we're in talks with uh, uh, many different companies here on Ireland uh, to create a, a very exclusive, very uh, unique utility package. I don't really have a direct answer to that, JR. Um, I haven't been looking at it uh, in in that kind of depth. I just just think about um, NFTs as uh, just another gallery, um, another way of transporting art from me to somebody else. I just would like to add to that a little bit as well. That I think the digital aspect is very important. Um, that a lot of these um, NFT projects that you know are based on community um, and the exclusive membership. I think what also drives people to them is also when you can get something physical. And I'm looking at this as an individual artist. Now I'm actually working on a bigger project as well. But part of my journey and my uh, roadmap is also exclusive physical. Physical basically is a um, a digital NFT is something that's linked to the physical object. Let it be whatever. In my case, it's going to be a fashion collection or 
um, print or anything else, like an exclusive experience, for example. So I think that's maybe also worth considering. Hey, um, so I'm looking to uh, deploy a project, and we have a, a community set up already. And so we're gonna, we've already told them we're going to be dropping them these NFTs. And so at the moment, we're struggling with the question of which blockchain is it going to be on. So I'm wondering, in the research you have been doing, the projects that you guys have already done, the immersion, your, your participation in Discord and Twitter in the communities, is there, do you guys have a sense of what the general perception is about dropping an NFT on one blockchain versus another? You know, if it's a community that, you know, paid a lot for the membership, for example, and you've said, we're going to drop an NFT, like, does, does, I don't know, Polygon have a kind of cheapness associated with it where people are expecting a good quality NFT to be on Ethereum? Have you guys come across that type of information? Petri, I think you need to answer that. <laughs> Go for it, Mark. I'll add my comment. We, so that, this has been a big part of our research. Um, we have um, been in meetings with uh, sponsors and partnerships, and we have been asked the exact same question. Um, we've been asked if, you know, are, are we going to cut our legs short by uh, not being on the Ethereum and going on the Polygon? Um, my answer, I, from what, especially what we're doing, we're going to be selling on the Polygon network. Um, from what I understand and what I see about the Polygon network is it's a, obviously it's a smaller currency, but it does have potential of growing. The gas fees does help um, a lot of the people that are only going to be buying one. Um, but if I was selling a, an NFT for, say, $1,000 or $5,000, then Ethereum would be the best for me, I would understand, because the the gas fees would be $200. When you're selling something at 1000 or 5000 $200 isn't really that much more of a hit. But if you're selling your NFT for $200, and then all of a sudden the gas fee behind it is also $200, then you know it, unless that project really does take off, it's going to take a lot longer for you to be able to actually see some sort of gain in your purchase. So the idea that we've done was that we we're going to go on a polygon network with a s much smaller um, gas fees on the idea that a lot of other people are also jumping on the same network and I believe that the currency will rise and will become a very popular net uh, platform. Yep, I think the only thing I'll add there is there are a lot of different marketplaces and new blockchains. Um, so you need to think about your project. Are you trying to go for the well-tested, potentially more expensive on Ethereum, very big marketplaces, or you can get the momentum of being on one of the newer chains with newer platforms. So there's a lot to consider, and sort of cost is definitely one of the big things there. I wonder, and I may be wrong, but it, this again, this reminds me of the internet. Well, you know, when the internet first came around, you had to use a specific company to get on the internet. Like it was AOL was a big one. And I remember way back when it was Cayman Online. I don't know if anyone remembers Cayman Online. Like that was, the, that was the only way to access the internet at that point. And I feel like it kind of sounds like the same conversation. What blockchain do I need to get on? What, you know? And it's like, you know, I, and so in my head, I think to a future when everything's just on the blockchain, you don't even need to think about what blockchain you're on. It's just, it's just fully integrated. Have you guys uh, considered that we did some research on the, on the um, mo uh, fractional ownership of the NFT? And it might be a question for Patrick as well. So I understand. So multiple people would own one NFT. With, with, with our um, Proud Turtles, the price point that we're starting at, at is $200. Um, so I would... I, I would feel that a lot of people for, for the price of $200 would want to have one for themselves. Um, from what I understand with the fractional, I don't know how that would work through the wallet because obviously you would have to have a crypto wallet to be able to buy your NFT. I don't know if you would be able to link three or four wallets together to be able to purchase one item. That might be something for, for Petri. I think the really interesting one here is definitely um, the piece that sold for 69 million uh, a while back because I know the guys who bought that, they're thinking of fractionalizing um, that um, 
technology, how you're going to do it, different ways to look at it. I mean, you can create NFT representations of that NFT. Um, the thing where this gets really interesting potentially is when you start going to the financial industry as well. Because over there, fractional ownership is something that's very common. A lot of people know that um, for financial instruments. And what makes an NFT really interesting is all the information you can put on it as well. With a normal ERC-20 token, you're limited with information that can sort of be transferred with it. Um, with NFTs, especially in the financial industry, there's a lot of potential where you can have that fractional ownership, secondary markets, all those kinds of things for reselling. Um, but I mean, it is no, still new. People are still exploring it, um, but it's very exciting. There's lots of opportunity. I mean, it really doesn't apply to me personally, but I know of um, a very famous like sculpture that actually has been somehow incorporated into like the fractal um, NFTs, and I don't know how exactly it works because I will, but it's just interesting that this happens and there must be a reason why people still go for that um, uh, pathway. But maybe it just only applies to really more, I don't know, valuable objects. Like we're talking about, you know, a sculpture that was lost somewhere and recreated. And But I just say personally right now, I would even stay away from, well, that's my observation that people are not very keen even on um, buying um a limited edition of the same NFT because people are more focused at the moment on one-on-ones. That's, I mean, obviously, obviously it's a bit different, uh, you know, aspect of the NFT we're talking about, but this is something that's not really advised at the moment. Like uh, people prefer to have like one unique NFT over sharing um, one, but maybe that's gonna change. Um, first, let me say um, thank you very much for sharing your experience and knowledge. It's really, really interesting and so exciting what you're doing. So I applaud you, and I'm sure everybody does here. And congratulations for being the first woman in Warsaw to um, launch an NFT right on. Um, my question is mechanical, functional. Um, do you have to go offshore to get the digital artists to the minting and all the various things you're doing? Um, or, or is there the expertise here? Is there anybody you can recommend? Oh, so the question is pretty much, can you do it in Cayman or do you need to go find someone else oh, somewhere? I mean, I don't live in Cayman, but I think it's uh, pretty much available everywhere, right? I mean, uh, that's the beauty of it, that you can be globally anywhere and just go for it. It depends on, the, obviously, the platform you're using. Uh, because like Patrice said, there's so many and there's up and coming platforms um, is becoming more accessible as well. And um, obviously you have to look at the aspect of which blockchain you want mint on it as well. Um, like we were discussing um, earlier. Um, yeah, I think uh, just uh, there's so many opportunities right now and to find a platform that really kind of like feels good about you, with, you know, when you want to get your project out there. But it's something to consider as well. I, I was actually thinking about myself recently. It's um, giving me a lot of thought about where I want to mint, want to mint my work now uh, when it goes to the gallery, the physical gallery, because we have to make a contract that I will have to deliver it to the wallet at the time of the, you know, of the exhibition, and then we have to also cover those gas fees. So we need to think of always, obviously, the pricing, like we were talking about. This is really was a really, really valid um, point that it's not really worth doing something NFT on Ethereum on two hundred dollars. If we're gonna cover the gas fees, it's probably can likely go up to the same price. So yeah, there's so much to think about. But I mean, obviously, I'm happy to also, you know, you should share your thoughts about that. So just so you know, we we've had to learn a lot about this. At one point, minting was a big big thorn in our side. We um, we didn't understand it. We were trying to figure out what it was. Um, every time that we did uh, look up about it, it seemed to somewhat brief talk about it, but it was actually talking about other things, especially about the gas fees. Um, obviously, we haven't launched yet. We are going to be launching this year. Um, and from what I understand with the minting is that, um, so we've loaded our images up onto uh, Open Seas on the Polygon network. <coughs> the gas fees actually covers the when you when you buy it, you when you purchase it, it encrypts your image, so it actually mints it when you buy it. So it's right now it's sitting on my platform, and it is ready to be sold. It hasn't been minted yet, which means the encryption hasn't been added in yet because I haven't sold it. 
So what happens is you, when, you, when it actually comes to minting, it's all, you actually do it on your computer when you press buy. And then what happens is once it then gets transferred into your wallet or your, your account, then that is then minted with the uh, address of when you bought it, um, who you bought it from, uh, the price that you bought it from, and then that all adds it into your, um, basically the history of that image. Perfect. Um, I think the question was partly also just how hard it is. Um, so with Dready, we used OpenSea to do it. Um, I think the technology is actually really easy to use. You just have to create a wallet. And then I think the important thing that a lot of people doesn't, don't think about is you have to store your private keys well, have your backup seed phrases stored securely. Because if you lose those, unfortunately, the NFTs are gone as well. Um, so I think that's technologically wise, that's the hard part. Um, as I mean, we just said, it's really, it gets minted automatically. These platforms are really easy to use. You connect your MetaMask, it's very easy to interact with them. So doing it in Cayman, doing it anywhere in the world, it's actually really easy. That's one of the nice things about this industry. So with that, I think we're pretty much at time. So I'm going to hand over to Mark from Harness just to wrap up for us. So first of all, I just want to thank the panelists, Adriana, Badia, Mark, Dreddy, and Pietri for moderating. I have to admit, I was agreeing with Badia, I wasn't expecting as many people to turn up as, as have, so thank you very much indeed for coming. And I'm sure you'll agree this was a really interesting discussion from people coming at this with lots of different perspectives at different levels of involvement in the space. I think we had a really good conversation between them all. So let's give a big round of applause to the panelists and Pietri, thank you. So what I'd like to do is just add a couple of thoughts to wrap this up and also give some context to it. And I think the, the discussion we had before about how many people are going into this space and just how much investment and resources we're seeing is quite remarkable, really. So last year, according to some stats from a place called DAP Radar, the NFT market in 2020 was about 100 million. And then last year, about 22 billion. And that's just phenomenal growth. And we've got predictions from, I think, Morgan Stanley that by 2030, the NFT market is predicted to be worth about 300 billion. And of that, going back to the metaverse discussion, and NFTs can form a part of the metaverse system, taken with the metaverse as a whole, including NFTs, Goldman Sachs predicts that total market will be worth around 8 trillion. So there's some phenomenal figures involved here, and that includes revenue, that includes licensing and businesses operating in the metaverse using NFTs. So I think even though it's relatively early stage now, some of the people who are here, some of the people in the audience who are doing projects involving NFTs are really exploring what this potential technology can offer and pushing the envelope. And it's fantastic to see people in the Cayman Islands really driving this forward. So it's um, very exciting. So I think the aim of this event was to take some of the headlines you're seeing about Board Ape Yacht Club and some of these really, really high value NFTs selling for enormous sums of money and bring that to what does that mean in Cayman? What are people doing here? How are they approaching it? And what are people in Cayman looking to do with NFTs? And I think we've had a really fantastic discussion on that and seen what it means from a practical perspective. I think the interest with NFTs at the moment is around digital generative art. We've seen a lot of that. Mark's done a lot of research and he's put together a really interesting collection, particularly with the rarity and uh, uh, tradables element, which I've not seen in some of these projects. So digital generative art is a hot topic. It's a very common use case for NFTs, but it's not the only case. And we've alluded before, Adriana mentioned about linking it to sculptures, for example. And we did a NFT auction last year with Dreddy with some of his digital artwork. And so NFTs have this ability to be attached to lots of different things. So for example, we're doing some work at the moment at Harneys with clients who are looking to link NFTs to physical artwork or to link them to athletes in some cases and image rights associated with them. So it's a delivery channel. You can attach lots of things to this NFT and then you can transfer that one NFT with those things attached to it to someone else. So if you think of it like that as the ability to attract and link things to it and then trade it, that allows you to offer that value directly to someone without using an intermediary. 
So it's a powerful way of engaging with an audience, with offering your content in new and innovative ways. And it allows people to explore ways of uh, creativity and production and royalties and giving back to some of the creators or the patrons in ways that weren't previously possible. So I think what's interesting about this technology is its potential to innovate. Uh, what we're doing at the moment with uh, creating digital art and physical art, that is not new. But what is new is the way in which it can be packaged together and delivered. It's not going to be appropriate for all artists. And I said this back in 2016 when I was standing up and talking to people about blockchain and crypto. It's not a solution for a problem you don't have. So it's very common, even a few years ago, to do something on the blockchain with crypto just because, just because everybody else was doing it. And it's not always going to make things easier. It's not always going to guarantee that your project's going to be a success. In fact, there's a risk that you become uh, somewhat irrelevant amongst the projects that do gain traction. So as I said a few years ago, if you are looking to use NFTs or explore the potential, don't be rushed in doing it but ensure that it fits in with what you generally want to do and that NFTs can enhance that offering and are used in a way that adds value to what you want to do. Done so skillfully, you'll find that there's a much better chance of success in what you're looking to do. There's lots to consider and to be careful um, about who you're working with. The uh, vagaries of human behavior continue to apply whether you're doing something with NFTs or not with NFTs, so uh, that doesn't mitigate that. And also, as mentioned before, it can take some time for NFTs to go mainstream. And Badia said before, you know, K-Man Online, AOL Online, Napster and Spotify disrupted music distribution. But that took a while, even back in uh, 2007, 2008, Spotify took a long time to gain traction. Same with Napster. Spotify might have been a bit later than that. So if you are going to do things with NFTs, it's a very good creative outlet. But it's one which needs to be looked at carefully. If you're going to buy NFTs expecting to retire early, I would prepare yourself for disappointment. You might have seen some very significant price increases and some really quite ludicrous sales going on. But with all asset classes, remember the line doesn't always go up. It can go down too, and sometimes quite dramatically down as we've seen in the last few weeks. I describe myself as um, cautiously, skeptically optimistic about this space. Partly because we're doing a lot of work in it, and I have done for many, many years. But also because, as we've seen today, the people who are involved in it, in the audience and on our uh, illustrious panel here, are doing so in ways that are creative and are carefully considered, rather than rushing in and trying to make a fast buck. They're approaching it with thoughtfulness and with a real need to ensure that their art brand is enhanced and that what they offer is something that people really want to buy which is a general point on NFTs, buy something you'd like rather than something you think is going to make money because it may or it may not. But at least if you've bought a piece of art or an NFT that you like, whether it makes money or not, you've collected something you like. So everybody's a winner. The other point to make about this stuff, and it was alluded to before, you're buying things that are very objectively hard to value. So yes, it might be seen to be worth something because that's what it's, the market price is. But especially with NFTs linked to physical assets or which have a bundle of rights associated with them, it is very, very difficult to work out what that's actually worth. And so trying to find a market value for these things can be an exercise in futility or perhaps misplaced expectations. So I started off with some very big figures about how much this market is worth and how much it could be worth in future. Kind of brought it down to a bit more of a practical concern in terms of getting involved in this space or buying the NFTs. But the point is, it's really exciting. There's a lot of potential. Going back to the point made before about minting, there's some legal and regulatory issues to consider, particularly around the intellectual property aspect of NFTs. So if you are looking to get involved in this space, it is worth making sure that you've got the right help on board and there's plenty of people in the island and in this room who can help with that. But overall, what I wanted to do tonight was to bring people together to listen to people in Cayman and Caymanian artists, whether they're on the panel or in the audience, and talk about a topic that's of particular interest right now, but really does have a local connection and a local manifestation. And I think you'll agree the panel have done a fantastic job tonight. They've really kind of brought that home and brought their own personal perspectives to it. So thank you very much indeed for that and very much appreciated.
thank you very much indeed for coming. It's very much appreciated. And feel free to join us over at Kamana Bay for some more conversation and for some food. And look forward to seeing you there. So thank you very much.